We shouldn't be treating each case as a catastrophe that's unacceptable. It has to be acceptable. The only alternative is where are we in five or 10 years in the future? Hmm. The only alternative is we're locked up forever. We are not all in this together. There are clear winners and clear losers. The winners are big government and the public servants and the political class. Their power and control is expanded by the rules they put in place as the private sector is weakened. All the while, not one of them taking any dollar of a pay cut to share the burden. Australia is a pretty rough and tumble place. It was a, a landmass settled by British criminals. It has flying foxes and gigantic spiders and all sorts of things that are going to try to kill you. And they survive because they're tough people out there, right? Until the Wu flu killed one more person, one more death, and the country shuts down. G'day and welcome to episode 52 of The Other Side. I'm Damien Curry. This is the show that brings you the news and views from a classical, liberal, sensible, centre-right perspective and tries to give a bit of a voice to the millions of Australians that are simply not being represented by either major political party or the mainstream media at the moment. So if you're as confused as we are and looking for sanity, we'll try to bring it to you here on the other side and cut through the BS being thrown at us from every angle. In a moment, I will be speaking to the national president of the newest political force in Australia, the Liberal Democratic Party, or the Lib Dems. It's a centre-right classical liberal party that I think viewers of this show will be thrilled to learn is having a massive rebirth and evolution, not a moment too soon for Australia. This could be the answer, folks. It could be the party that saves us from Labour, Green, Socialist madness on one side and the spinelessness of the Liberal National Coalition governments on the other side, who sadly seem to have abandoned their commitment to core classical liberal values and conservatism. Economist and lecturer Dr John Humphreys is the founder and president of the Lib Dems and he will join me later in the show for a podcast length interview that you do not want to miss. Don't forget we come to you a couple of times a week. You can catch us on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, we're on the Discernable platform that's discernible with an A or just search up the other side Australia. You need to put the Australia in. Uh, you can also listen to us in audio format on all good podcast platforms. Again, just DuckDuckGo or Google the other side Australia. Our politicians and our media continue to play the lockdown and border closures game, oblivious to the rights of grown adults to move around as they choose, to be with their loved ones as they choose to come and go from state to state or country to country as they choose. By setting a date sometime in the near future and by offering and providing vaccines to all Australians and respecting that some won't want them, we could open up the country, open up state borders and get back to normal as soon as possible. We have to grow up and accept the harsh, tragic reality that we cannot crush and kill this virus and that it's delusional to keep thinking that we can. Now, if you sit on the political left and you've bought into the whole right-wing nut jobs and anti-vaxxers want to kill us all narrative that's being driven way too hard right now by our political elite and by a media that simply is failing in its duty to challenge our political elite, just bear with me and think it through carefully, okay? It's not a choice between no deaths and some deaths. It's a choice between some deaths now, but no other serious impacts on our economy, on health of people, on people's well-being, happiness, livelihoods, ability to be with their family. It's a choice between that or some deaths later with a lot of serious impacts. So it's a choice between some deaths now and some deaths later. Some deaths now with lots and lots of trouble or some deaths later without lots and lots of trouble. At least one third of us now realize that all this theater of lockdowns and border closures is political and can only delay the spread until we get prepared with treatment facilities and hospital beds and the vaccine rollout. 
We have to accept that some people will get sick. Some may even die. We have to accept that it's a tragic part of nature. We cannot blame the government when it happens. We cannot blame our political opponents when it happens. Just like we don't have 20 kilometer an hour speed limits on our roads, even though we know that would reduce road tolls. Just like we don't completely ban some toxic chemicals because of the enormous good that they can also do. Just like we don't ban flying because sometimes planes crash. We are humans. This is planet Earth. And we need to constantly manage risks as best we can through our lives. I believe Aussies are starting to get it. That the cost of lockdowns and border closures simply does not justify the risk that we're avoiding. And by cost, I don't mean the money side of things. Although money is actually pretty important if you want to take care of people, by the way. But by cost, I mean the health costs of people dying from other things and suffering. Mental health costs and family tragedy induced by lockdowns and border restrictions, tearing families apart at some of their most crucial moments. By cost, I mean small businesses going to the wall every single day. Dreams destroyed, savings and investments wiped out. Think about that. Jobs eliminated. Tradies who can't work. The whole economy slowly grinding to a halt. By cost, I mean children being deprived of proper education in the classroom and the social interaction with other kids that they so desperately need for their healthy development. If you're three, this nonsense has been going on half your life. By cost, I mean the loss of faith in our system of government and our economy so that people who would invest in business and creating jobs in the future will think twice before they take any risks and spend on any new projects for fear that in Australia we can't trust our system of law to protect their fundamental rights as investors and business people from politicians and bureaucrats who make all the rules but won't give up one red cent to share the pain. We are not all in this together. There are clear winners and clear losers. The winners are big government and the public servants and the political class. Their power and control is expanded by the rules they put in place as the private sector is weakened. All the while, not one of them taking any dollar of a pay cut to share the burden. The winners are the big corporations who have the resources to survive while their smaller competitors hit the wall, unable to make it through the endless lockdowns, family businesses ruined, salaries unpaid, jobs lost. All of this adds up. It adds up to an awful lot of pain and a terrible amount of suffering that we can just no longer continue to ignore. I thought it might make sense to take a look at how commentators abroad are viewing our lockdowns here in Australia. The Daily Wire's Michael Knowles did this segment on his show this past week. Australia's shutting down again. Australia's totally locking down. Like, it's going to be hard to leave your home locking down. Why? Australia is a pretty rough and tumble place. It was a, a landmass settled by British criminals. It has flying foxes and gigantic spiders and all sorts of things that are going to try to kill you. And they survive because they're tough people out there, right? Until the Wu flu killed one more person, one more death, and the country shuts down. Good evening. Within hours, Sydney will be in the grip of much tougher restrictions. The Premier clamping down on the stubborn Delta outbreak with what she's calling a no regrets policy. And this is why. From a record 82,000 tests, the state today recorded 111 cases and tragically the third COVID death in this outbreak, a man aged in his 80s from the city's southeast. Across Greater Sydney, retail shops will now close. A small list of essential stores can remain open. Construction sites across the city 
shut down. And from midnight tonight, 110 suburbs across Liverpool, Fairfield and Canterbury Bankstown will be sealed shut. That's 900,000 residents who can't leave their area, even for work. So you've got hundreds of thousands of tests, well over 100,000 tests. You've got a relatively small number of cases, some hundreds of cases, and you've got one more death. The third of this outbreak, but now just this one more, one death from this round of testing. So they're going to shut down everywhere. <laughs> they're going to shut down whole suburbs. You can't go to work. You are locked basically in your home. Shut down retail shops. Something tells me that the people who can't pay their bills are going to have some regrets. Something tells me the people who can't go to church are probably going to have some regrets. The people who can't be with their loved ones while they die, some regrets. The people who can't get married, some regrets. The people who can't bury their dead, some regrets. You get the point. The people who can't live their lives, I think, are going to have some regrets. In the amount of time that it took to watch just that clip from that segment, on Australia's Channel 9 News, 90 people died. Not from COVID. They just died because people die. People die all the time. They die from a whole host of causes. They die from heart attacks. They die from cancers. They die from car accidents. They die from pianos falling on their head while they walk across the street. They just, people die. That's a fact. Mortality is a fact of life that in modernity we try to deny as best we can. But it's true. All of life is a preparation for dying. Get used to it. You will have a much better life if you accept this fact. And because hanging concentrates the mind, you will also, one hopes, look beyond just this mortal coil to, to the metaphysical underpinnings of our world. But we can't do that in our, our age. So while the Wu flu kills relatively very few people, very, very few people as a proportion of those who are dying. Australia is shutting down again. That will happen here if we do not exercise our political power and push back. That's US commentator Michael Knowles on his popular show on the Daily Wire platform, just for a bit of outside perspective for us. The Australian newspaper reported this week that Ross Cameron, a colourful member of the Howard government and an ex-Sky News host, has joined the Liberal Democrats to help recruit people to run for the Senate for the party in the next federal election. As we discussed in our last show, former Queensland Premier and two-term Lord Mayor of Brisbane, Campbell Newman, has quit the Liberal National Party with plans to run for the Senate in the upcoming federal election. And the newspaper believes that the Liberal Democrats will be his most likely new team. Campbell Newman insists he's in talks with a number of people and will make a decision soon, but may run as an independent. Prominent New South Wales Liberal Party strategist and author of the 2018 book, Make the Liberals Great Again, John Ruddick, also announced this week that he was going to run for the Liberal Democrats in the lower house Sydney seat of Warringah, that's Tony Abbott's old seat, currently held by Zali Stegall. The Lib Dems have been actively recruiting liberals who are fed up with lockdowns, state border closures, mismanagement of the vaccine rollout, and what they perceive as weak leadership and big spending policies under Scott Morrison. Ross Cameron told The Australian that the Lib Dems have attracted significant new financial support and they now want candidates with big profiles to win Senate seats for the party. Cameron said, I was a member of the Liberal Party for 40 years, and I can say we will tear strips off the Liberals and Nationals like hammerhead sharks tearing at the carcass of a sperm whale. There you go. Former National Party leader and Deputy Prime Minister to John Howard, John Anderson, recently took a shot at the top spot on the National Party's New South Wales Senate ticket, but he was passed over by the party for a younger party official. John Anderson has been approached by the Lib Dems, but he has so far declined to join them. And just imagine if they got Jeff Kennett in Victoria. Could you imagine Kennett, Newman and Anderson all running? It'd be hard to imagine that they wouldn't be a new and powerful political force and very easily win the balance of power 
in the Senate. Alan Jones put it very well on his Sky News show this week, saying that, quote, there's an undercurrent out there. Thousands feel as Campbell Newman does. Is the Liberal Party for the little bloke? No. Is the Liberal Party for small government? No. Is the Liberal Party for greater freedom? No. Jones said, I'm getting 800 letters a day from people who say they've nowhere to turn and Campbell Newman is someone they could end up turning to. Disillusionment with the lockdowns is rampant. The polls don't lie, said Jones. So what is the Liberal Democratic Party and what is it up to? Dr. John Humphreys is the man who started it all 20 years ago. Dr. Humphreys is the senior economist at the Australian Taxpayers Association. He lectures in economics at Queensland University, and he's the national president of the Lib Dems. I spoke to Dr. Humphreys earlier and asked him firstly to explain what the party is and what it stands for. The idea that, uh, that the motivation underlying the Liberal Democrats was uh, the I felt there was a need in Australia for a genuinely small government party, a classical liberal party. It was set up some 20 years ago. And as you can tell by my uh, wonderful youthful looks, uh, that 20 years ago, I was even 20 years younger than this. So uh, it was, I was in my early 20s when the party was set up. And I was uh, fresh from the excitement of discovering uh, Milton Friedman and uh, Frederick von Hayek uh, and discovering the joys of classical liberalism, small government, skepticism of government power, uh, free markets, individual liberty. And so at the time, I went out hunting for a classical liberal political party to join. Uh, and unfortunately, after a while, I found there was none. Uh, so I got together with some friends and we started putting together the plan for the Liberal Democrats. And 20 years later, here we are. I've got to say one of the inspirations was, if you follow New Zealand politics at all, the ACT Party in New Zealand. The ACT right. Party is, the ACT stands for the Association of Consumers and Taxpayers. It was set up by, uh, well, Roger Douglas was one of the big names, the former finance minister in the New Zealand uh, I think in the 80s, during the 80s, uh, the reforming government uh, back then. Uh, and so they have the ACT Party, which is like a, a moderate libertarian classical liberal party. And I looked over the ditch to New Zealand quite jealously. Uh, and uh, my, one of my drivers was, I thought Australia needed a party like that. Uh, a party on the, I guess, the centre-right, classical liberal free market uh, space in politics. Uh, in, in many ways, like many of the principles described by the Liberal Party, but uh, the difference being uh, we meant it. Uh, we actually wanted them to be a, a small government, uh, you know, promote small government principles. So, so John, um, you are at the moment having a bit of a resurgence. We'll talk about that in a second. But uh, I guess uh, we are at a time when it's appropriate for a resurgence. A lot of people have been complaining that there doesn't seem to be a party standing up for freedom and liberty amidst all this COVID thing. They're all too, the major parties are too afraid to do so because they're concerned about keeping everybody safe and the perception in the electorate that people want to be kept safe. Um, someone once said that the idea that you could call yourself a socialist in the United States and hope to get elected or even considered to be the president um, was, it was a bit of a pipe dream with Bernie Sanders uh, being the example uh, used. Uh, we're now in a situation in Australia where uh, Australia is a very, very left-wing country um, a lot of uh, socialism and a lot of policies that are uh, you know almost nanny state uh, to an outside observer that's at least how we're seen by by people in other countries um, what's your take on the current environment in Australia and do you really think that a libertarian party espousing classical liberal values uh, could ever hope to get serious power so there's a lot to unpack there. I would say to one degree, it's even worse than, than what you say in that uh, it, it seems to me that authoritarianism is on the rise, both on the left and in many parts of the mainstream right, uh, which, which worries me. There seems to be a, a widespread disregard for the importance of just basic human individual liberty and the concept of individuals making their own decision, being responsible for the outcome of their own decisions and being able to, and this is crucial in this day and age, take on your own risk and you manage your own risk yourself as an adult, uh, being treated like an adult. Uh, and it doesn't seem that either major party uh, is, is really standing up for those principles. Uh, so I take your point that Australia has drifted to the left, especially on economics. The, uh, the, the story of the last hundred years has been a, a pretty depressing, unmistakable trend upward in the size of government, higher tax, yes. higher spending, more regulation. And that's fairly consistent across the board. Uh, when both sides of, including when both sides of uh, politics have been in power. So I, I take your point, there has been a leftward trend in Australia, 
But worse than that, it seems it's not like the, the mainstream right, the notionally the, the Liberal and National Party, are pushing back very strongly for individual liberties in this day and age. So it's uh, it, twice as depressing. On, on the role of a, a potential uh, moderate libertarian or classical liberal party in the Australian politics, uh, I don't pretend that the majority of Australians are, are libertarian. I understand that that's not the case, uh, but right. the Liberal Democrats aren't really pitching to be uh, a 50% plus one political party. We're in a bit of a different space. And I guess this harks back a, a bit to answer your first question again. Uh, what was I doing in, in setting up a, a political party? I was quite self-consciously setting up a, a minor party, a, a party that didn't have to be 50% plus one, because you're able to do different things when you pitch to be a minor party. A major party has to follow opinion polls. Uh, they have to follow the zeitgeist of the age. They can't really lead. They have to follow or they very quickly become former politicians or, and the opposition. So a minor party has the, the opportunity to exist a little bit outside or on the edge of the Overton window. We can push the discussion. We can say things that are true but not yet popular. Hopefully we say it in, in such a way that we can convince people and make it more popular. But the yeah. major parties suffer. Look, there's good people in the major parties. Uh, you know, there's some good people in the current Liberal Party. James, very Patterson, good. Uh, Amanda yeah. Stoker. There's some good people there, but they are hamstrung by the nature of the game they're playing, and that is major party politics has to be 50% plus one. As a minor party, we can uh, be a 10% party, say things that are true and need to be said but aren't yet popular. Uh, and by doing that, I think we can help uh, push push the political discussion in a better direction, actually help Amanda Stoker and James Patterson and good people inside the Liberal Party to be able to do what they need to do by being able to shift the debate in that direction to start with. So uh, yep. I don't pretend that we're about to be a 50% party. Uh, I do think, though, as you say, that the political uh, winds are changing. Like I said, the political climate is changing, if you will. Uh, there was, it's been a bit of a tough time for libertarian ideas and libertarian parties for the last little while, 10 years, say especially with the GFC and, and uh, the, the clamour for more government, to, to more government involvement, more government programs to come and save people. Mm. Uh, I think there is starting to be a pushback now. There is starting to be, it's still a minority, but a, a growing awareness that we cannot forever hand over our, our, our fate to political actors. Uh, we cannot forever get uh, politicians to try to save us with another, another program, uh, another lockdown. Uh, and uh, it's, it's not... It's not there yet in terms of it being a 50% movement, but that growing minority needs a voice. And we have the virtue of having uh, been quite an obvious pro-freedom party for 20 years. Uh, people might accuse us in the past of being too hung up on being too pro-freedom, too principled on, on the freedom front. And I think that's going to work for us in this instance, because people are looking around now and they're saying, I need a party that's actually going to stick to the principles of individual liberty. Uh, and we've been here for 20 years with the consistent message of consistently being skeptical of government and arguing that people should take back their own choices and their own responsibilities. That's a crucial flip side of having freedom is you need to be responsible for your choices and take on your own risk management. So I, it I seems to be very much the Liberal Democratic Party's moment, I guess, for you after 20 years of struggling, but you've, you've had successes. You had a, a senator in David Lanhelm in New South Wales, so he was a, a federal senator. Uh, you've got um, David Limbrick, of course, uh, and, uh, uh, Mr. Tim Coul yes, Tim Coulty in Victoria in the Legislative Council. So, you know, you are making a, a, an impact. And I've heard people describe David Limbrick as the de facto opposition leader um, in, in Victoria, which at the moment I think he is. Uh, and he's a good friend of, of, of the discernible platform. has been on uh, Matt Wong's shows quite a lot. Um, so, uh, John, this new era, let's let's talk a little bit about it. We've had an announcement from a very, very uh, senior liberal who, who wrote a book uh, in 2018 called Make the Liberal Party Great Again, Mr. John Ruddick. Uh, he um, was very committed to reform within the Liberal Party and he sort of gave up and uh, has, has come out in the last couple of weeks saying that he's joining the Liberal Democratic Party and he's going to run for Tony Abbott's old seat in Warringah in Sydney. Uh, to try and oust Zali Stegall. Uh, tell me, uh, you know, this is this is that's one. And I think we had R Ross Cameron's announced that he's going to uh, form a, another former liberal uh, going to join the Liberal Democratic Party. Uh, there was also speculation about uh, former Queensland Premier and Brisbane Lord Mayor uh, Campbell Newman may be joining you or he's in talks with various uh, people. But what what is the what's happening? Are you up? Are you really uh, gearing up for for something in the next twelve months? Yes. Well, I mean, I, I think as we were discussing before, this moment in the political cycle uh, is one that I think uh, 
there is a growing demand for a party like the Liberal Democrats. Uh, and thankfully, we've been here for 20 years, so we have the track record. People know we weren't created yesterday to pretend we believe in these ideas. We've believed in them, believed in these ideas during the times when they weren't popular. So you can trust us that we mean them. And at the same time, I think there is growing disillusionment uh, and uh, frustration uh, mm. amongst the actually small government people inside the Liberal Party. So there's been, uh, I think, lots of reasons for small government people to be frustrated with the Liberal and National Party for a while. And I think it's particularly coming to a head with regards to the response to uh, the COVID situation uh, with the, the, the overhyping of the fear and then the overreaction to the hyped fear. Uh, and then the massive amounts of, of government spending and debt upon debt uh, to the point where it's, it's unprecedented levels and unforgivable levels of debt that we're passing on to future generations. And we're doing it all based on a fear campaign with no end in sight, with no solution mm. available. And mm. for small government people to look at the, the state of politics in Australia and see that if they're in the Liberal Party, their side is just as guilty uh, of perpetuating this fear campaign and then spending money we don't have. Uh, I think there's a growing amount of frustration. And uh, at the same time that the political winds are coming our way, the frustration in the Liberal Party, I think they... John Ruddock is a, is a great get for us, as is Ross Cameron. And I think Cam Newman, Newman is a, uh, uh, would be an excellent candidate and an excellent addition to the Senate, however he gets there. Uh, but I don't think that'll be the end of the conversation. I think you will find more names uh, coming across. And indeed, we already are having a, a spike in membership applications, uh, including from people who were previously non-political, but a big chunk as well, who are, who are former disillusioned, now uh, former Liberal Party members. Who are coming across, leaving the old Liberal Party and joining the actually Liberal Party. Another um, another prominent high profile uh, conservative is uh, John Anderson, the former Deputy Prime Minister. He's become very popular because he has an excellent podcast, and I think that's that's uh, raised his profile among younger Australians quite considerably. Um, he was recently rejected by the National Party for another tilt at the Senate. He wanted to sort of play a an elder statesman role. In the Senate, I understand it. Um, is 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 he on your list? I'm going to say I, I am one of those people. I'll, I'll take the the characterization of of young if you'll give it to me. I am one of those people that enjoys his podcast and, and really appreciates them. I think he has a, a very good uh, style there, and he comes across as a very likable person. Very. I don't actually know John myself. I haven't been in in talks with him. Uh, I'd be interested to to chat with him and find out where he stands on the issues. We. We are a party uh, of principle. We've stuck with that for 20 years. And I think it's one of the reasons people like us is they know we don't have a, a we believe statement and then turn around and do the opposite. Uh, so I, I'd love to find out uh, where John Anderson stands on a number of issues and, and have a conversation with him. But I haven't as yet, so I don't know what else to say other than the fact that I'm a fan of his podcast. There are, I mean, there are people who dream of a dream team, right? And 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 perhaps, you know, seeing, and if, you know, I don't, if you were successful in, in getting Campbell Newman to join in Queensland, then you had, you know, John Anderson in New South Wales and maybe get Jeff Kennett in Victoria. Um, the thing could build quite a lot of momentum and one does lead to another. It's like almost like casting a movie or putting a, a football team together. You know, I'll go if you'll go. Um, is that uh, is that sort of the vision or are you uh, are you a little bit are you feeling a little bit more uh, cautious and humble than that at the moment? Well, I mean, those those are all good names you've mentioned. Uh, there are a bunch of other names, and I don't want to start name dropping now, but uh, we have been pursuing a, a number of interesting leads. And if they, they come to light, I'll come to you first. You can have the scoop. Uh, okay. There's, there's a number of interesting names being thrown around who I think are a, would make what I would call a dream team. My definition of a dream team isn't necessarily the person with the highest profile. It's the, the highest profile person who is best at espousing yes. and, and defending small government values, classical liberal yep. values. And, and yep. we are, as I said, we've always been a party of principle. And I believe it makes sense, not just because we believe in the principles, but strategically, it makes sense to be a party of principle. I think it's in our interest to keep to those. Mm. So uh, we are having a lot of conversations with very interesting people, some of whom I think cross over with our values very nicely. And stay tuned for, for more announcements. Uh, we would All like right. to have a dream team, but not at the expense of our principles, of course. Oh, well, that's that's refreshingly nice to hear coming from a political party president. Um, uh, John, uh, just in terms of your policy approach and things like that, uh, you are, as this program is, I guess, a cl it's targeted. I make no secret of the fact that we are a classical liberal program, centre-right, libertarian-leaning. Um, we, we may take conservative, look at conservative social issues, uh, but we, 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 we wouldn't call ourselves a conservative 
um, program. Um, likewise, you sort of wouldn't call yourselves a conservative party either. Uh, on the social issues front, um, do you think there'll be difficulties uh, reconciling um, some of your new membership with some of uh, the existing approach of the party? Uh, I, I mean, on certain issues, you are, um, you know, you do take a fa fairly uh, small L liberal position like pro-choice on abortion. Um, you are pro-voluntary uh, assisted uh, dying. Uh, I understand that you're sort of, you lean towards as libertarians tend to do uh, some sort of relaxation or decriminalization or legalization of of, um, of illicit drugs. Um, how do you see the, the typical conflicts of um, conservatives and libertarians playing out in, in Australia? That's, it's a good question. I would, uh, I would carve off one of those issues and maybe put it in, the, in a side basket, and that is the, the issue of, of pro-life, pro-choice. There's libertarians on both sides of that issue and very good okay. arguments in both directions. So right. I would say that's, that's not necessarily one that, that fits into this discussion. But the other two you mentioned, the uh, voluntary assisted dying and drug law reform, it is certainly true that those are, uh, have historically been central to a classical liberal pitch. They come back to the core idea uh, that uh, each adult owns themselves. You own your body. Uh, the government uh, shouldn't be telling you uh, what to inject or what not to inject into your body. Uh, the government shouldn't be uh, controlling uh, you know, what you do with your own life as long as you're not harming uh, other people, the, the old harm principle from J.S. Mill. So that is uh, core to what we have stood for. That is, I think, uh, it can be. It, it isn't always, but that can be consistent uh, with conservative principles, uh, depending, I guess, what you mean by conservative. But uh, conservative moral principles, conservative in your own life, can be quite consistent with the idea of then not necessarily enforcing your moral preferences on others. There are plenty of people in our party who are personally conservative or, or quite strictly religious, uh, and they would be uh, aghast at the idea of being accused of being libertines themselves, which is sometimes an accusation thrown at libertarians, that we're all just libertines arguing for drug law reform because we want to get high. And that's quite a, an, an unfair and inaccurate uh, representation of the argument uh, as the fact that we have plenty of personally morally conservative people in the party kind of attests. The yeah. argument is more along the lines of uh, the best way to treat people is as adults who own themselves, who own their lives and own their decisions, and therefore should be responsible for their decisions as well. Uh, but going back to that first principle of, of individual liberty. As for how that'll fit with the, the new incoming members, there's always going to be some, some nuance and give and take. There's no two people on earth who agree with each other exactly. But I've been quite encouraged through uh, conversations, especially with John Ruddock, who I think is, uh, is a bit of a, a star candidate for us. He's an ex excellent example uh, of somebody who I think has always been a small government man, effectively a, a classical liberal, uh, skeptical of government power. I think he's always basically belonged in our party. He, he's, he's tried to make progress in the Liberal Party and good on him for that. Uh, but I think he's, uh, he's come home and he is another example of someone who is personally morally conservative, but is not uh, hell bent on making sure that he imposes his moral choices on others. Uh, so you said that your membership applications are up. Is that coming from, do you think, mainly the the Liberal Party and the National Party? Well, as I, I said before, we've seen uh, also a big uptick on people who have been not involved in politics at all, especially in Victoria. Right. So we've had a big uptick in former Liberals in New South Wales, and I think uh, you, that's linked into the John Ruddick uh, and Ross Cameron uh, element. And we've had a big uptick in people uh, in Victoria who don't have much of a history uh, in politics. And I think that has a lot to do with David Limbrick playing effectively the role, as you mentioned, mm. effectively the, the leader of the opposition. The Liberal Party's gone missing. Uh, they don't know what to stand for. They're, they're scared of getting wedged every which way they look. And of course, they can't fall back on principles because they're aiming for that uh, ever elusive 50% plus one. And David Limbrick can fall back on our principles because that's why we exist, a party of principle. Uh, and so I think that's resonating with a lot of people and people who previously hadn't paid attention to politics, uh, but are getting frustrated with the never-ending lockdowns with no plan in sight, uh, are seeing David Limbrick and the Liberal Democrats uh, and finding an excuse to get active in politics for the first time. So two yeah. parts of that answer, if you will. I, I understand that the LDP will be a friend of the of the Liberal Party, no doubt. Uh, the, the, the real concern, the real worry is the Labor Party and the Greens. Um, do you see disenfranchised a lot of division, a lot of loss of uh, values, focus and integrity within the Labor Party at the moment? Um, do you see uh, some of the disenfranchised Labor voters might might move over to a, a libertarian party? 
Well, I think especially in the age of COVID, uh, in terms of the responses to COVID, I've seen some polling that suggests about a quarter of the people who are getting on the streets and actively opposing the, the lockdowns and, and the COVID measures are, are Labour supporters, or perhaps I should say former Labour supporters, given the current context. And I imagine a lot of those people would be looking for a party that's actually willing to stand up on this issue and give them a voice. As the major parties, the, the uh, Liberal National Coalition and the Labour Green Coalition, uh, all of those four parties are basically in lockstep in con continuing the, the fear campaigns and the overreaction to COVID. Uh, and so where are the people that previously voted for those parties supposed to go? And uh, as a party that's been on the front edge of defending individual liberty and opposing this fear-based overreaction, I think we'll end up picking up former voters uh, across the board. Maybe not too many former Greens voters, but you know, who knows if they, uh, they want to embrace freedom, we'll take them. But yeah, I think we'll get some former Labour, uh, although, as I said before, disillusioned liberals and pre people who are previously non-political seems to be the, the current flavor. Yeah, well, I think the current, I mean, there is a vacuum, you know, there's a desperate need. Um, one of the reasons I started this show when I came back to Australia was I noticed there's just nobody representing the small government message very, very strongly. Um, because, of course, government feeds itself, the political class feeds itself. So it just grows and grows and grows until someone says, or until the public say, hang on a minute, we need to pull back on this. Um, I've always liked so I think to this there's show. time for some small government focus in Australia. Uh, the flip side of that is the the cultural shift to the nanny state mentality, which supports that the I want to be parented, I want to be taken care of, I don't want to have to be an adult and be responsible for my own uh, health or my own life and my own decisions. Uh, I want welfare and I want to be looked after by by the government. Um, and, and I guess, uh, you know, there's, there's also very little support for small business, which, um, you know, we seem to be having support for corporations uh, from the, the Liberal National Coalition. And we seem to have uh, maybe just support for big government from the Labor Green side. Um, there, is a, there is a gap there. Uh, I guess the big question I want to finish on is COVID. You know, uh, we talk about there's nothing worse than a pandemic for, for, for liberal thinking um, because it is the one area where maybe the collective becomes more important than the individual's rights. And we have to look at um, our responsibilities to one another. How do you reconcile uh, the reality? Uh, some of my viewers probably won't, won't agree with me even saying that this is a reality, but the idea that um, herd immunity is an important thing to attain because if if we get to 70, 80, 90 percent vaccination, then you're going to have um, lots and lots of people who are unable to get vaccines for various health reasons. Um, they're going to be protected automatically from that herd immunity. Uh, so isn't there this push for us all to do the right thing and be collectively responsible for the collective good? Uh, if we open up the borders, there are going to be issues uh, if we open up Australia to the world, uh, obviously there are going to be issues. Uh, it's a tough time to sell a message of liberty, isn't it, when people are so worried about their health and their safety? There is uh, a lot to unpack in what you said. Just if I can just cheekily dodge the question to start with, I'll come back to it, I promise, uh, and comment on something you said at the beginning there about uh, support for big business and big government. Those two things often go together. You'll find this the, the age of lockdowns has been great for big business, of course, because everyone still goes back to their the coals and woolies uh, of the world. It hasn't been good for small business at all. They've been shut down and really struggling. Uh, but in general as well, and this is something that's a bit harder to see at first blush, uh, regulation, regulation on business, generally speaking, helps big business and hurts small business. So yeah, absolutely. Say, a lot government. of people don't realise it. Big government programs that are, you know, passed... And they use beautiful language when they pass it, you know, there to save the consumer. A lot of that regulation is being promoted by big business because that regulation acts as a handbrake on small business mm. being able to compete with the established players. Well, it's even a barrier to entry, right? I mean, you can't even get started sometimes as a small business because look at all these procurement systems we've got to make everything fair and good and transparent and open. So it all sounds lovely. You have all these massive regulations and then... Most small businesses, small consultancies, people like that, they can't get in the door because they, they need a procurement department <laughs> to take yeah. care of all the work that has to be done just to just to sign up to serve some of these clients. And I actually, accidentally, I totally take your point uh, about the need for a small uh, business party. And I think that has to be a, a small government party because yeah. uh, regulation, regulation imposes a cost on business. That cost is a very small percentage of the turnover for a big business. 
So big business is happy to have extra regulation, barrier to entry for their competitors and easy for them to pay. But it is a significant impost on small business. So uh, they, they need to have a, a small government, skeptical of government, low regulation, low tax party to be able to, to defend and support small business. And that is us. We are the small government and small business party. Uh, so then uh, having taken that segue, I'll go back to your, your question. Look, I, I take your point. This can be the, the COVID issue, especially at the beginning, can be a, a really vexed and difficult issue. Uh, and I don't, uh, I don't begrudge people that uh, when the COVID pandemic first kicked off, uh, if they, they started to, to question a lot of their previous assumptions or, or to suspect that maybe we should put a, a few uh, issues that we normally worry about aside, I don't begrudge that first instinct when we didn't have much information. Uh, I get that. I think we've got a lot more information now. So I think we, we could have an interesting philosophical discussion about which liberties do we suspend in the middle of, at the start of a pandemic where we've got a lack of information. That's a really interesting philosophical question, and perhaps we can we can argue that uh, at the pub later. But the question we've got today is a little different because we're not at the start of a pandemic anymore. We have a lot right. more information. And, and right now, it is abundantly clear that the lockdowns and most of the government restrictions are creating more costs than benefits. And I don't mean to say they have no benefits. I get it. Lockdowns do create some benefit. They, they slow the spread. You put that in the benefit column, but no serious policymaker does a benefit-benefit analysis. You do a benefit cost analysis. You've got to exactly. measure both columns honestly. And the costs to lockdowns and the government's response to COVID now uh, has been astronomical. It's, it's unbelievable and disproportionate, disproportionate to the situation. So the information we've got now, I would say it's, it's quite easy, either on classical liberal or on just good benefit cost analysis, public policy grounds. It's quite easy to, to come down on the side of individual liberty on this issue. But I take your point at the beginning of this pandemic. It was a much harder issue to, for people to navigate. And so I, I don't begrudge people perhaps having a different reaction uh, 12, 18 months ago. How are we going to open up, John, though? You know, I mean, we've got so much fear out there now. Um, oh, people are not going to accept even one death, and that's just ridiculously unrealistic. They're not going to accept any COVID infection. We keep talking about every positive test as a case. You know, uh, as soon as we start to get people in hospital, everyone freaks out even more. Um, it, it's right. just, and there might be different strains and variants. Most of them will be weaker. They won't make people as sick. They may be more contagious, but they'll just pass through. Uh, that's the usual evolution of a virus. But you do get these variants of concern that pop up every now and then that might have a twist to them that it can make them a little bit more dangerous. I don't think Delta is proving to be one of them, but there, that can happen. Um, how do we? We have to learn how to live with the threat of serious viral agents. Um, and without freaking out, I mean, we need some serious policies and decisions to be made in advance of what happens and scenario planning and scenario mapping, right? This has been the, the problem with this discussion from the beginning is there was no honest uh, discussion of where we're going to be in two or three years time. Uh, and so if, if you look into the future, if you consider what are we like in five years time, you know, five or 10 years time, even look into the future, the only real options that we've got a perpetual authoritarian state that are locking us in our house, you know, almost Soviet style which is unimaginable in five or 10 years time, I hope. Or at some point between now and then, we, uh, we open up even though the virus will spread, even though people will get it. And even though, unfortunately, some people will die. I mean, this, this is the nature of life. Uh, life is risky and no one gets out alive. Uh, people are gonna have to take on that risk management and risk assessment themselves at some point in time. So if we know it's gonna happen at some point, then uh, what is the argument for not doing it earlier? Well, we haven't had the vaccine rollout yet. All right. So we, we set a date in a couple of months time once everyone's had a chance to get the vaccine. And then as soon as that time has come, uh, with David Limbrick has called it Freedom Day. He suggested the 2nd of November, but the actual date isn't that important. We can quibble over it. As soon as that date's come, we need to unwind all of these regulations. I don't, I don't mean, just mean uh, like the lockdowns, although we should end the lockdowns immediately. Uh, I mean, all of it, the QR codes, the, the social distancing, the restrictions on businesses, uh, the closed border, the closed international border, leaving you know, families stranded apart for 18 months. Uh, it all needs to end as soon as people have had a chance to get that vaccine. And what needs to happen immediately is people talking about it need to be much more honest with the public about uh, it, is, it is okay for there to be some cases. We shouldn't be treating each case as a catastrophe that's unacceptable. It has to be acceptable. The only alternative is where are we in five or 10 years in the future? 
Mm. The only alternative is that we're locked up forever. So we're going to have to open up eventually. So we need to start being honest with people. And that's hard that's to right. do for major parties. So I'll swing this back, uh, I, I hope, as a nice little uh, circle around to the beginning. That's hard to do for major parties because they have to be led by polls uh, and you know focus groups. And at the moment, there's a lot of fear out there. So if you're a major party pollster, of course, you're going to be giving suggestions to your political leaders, you know, lean into the fear, uh, exacerbate the fear and then respond to the fear. That's good politics at the moment. I get that. And so both major parties kind of have to do that a little bit. I wish there was more principle there, but there just isn't. Uh, so who do you go to to, to bell the cat on, on this issue? And it's think tanks a little bit. The IPA has done good work. Some media personalities. Alan Jones has done good work, but also minor parties. Minor parties of principle are able to stand up on this issue. And that's where we hope to be able to push the conversation, push the Overton window and start to get people used to this idea that we're going to have to open up. There's a huge amount of costs every moment we stay locked down and all of these restrictions and the border closures, these are huge costs. And we're going to have to open up. So we need to open up as soon as we can to stop paying these costs and give people back their lives because we need yep. to be doing more than just existing. We need to get back to actually living our lives. Well, it's great to hear an economist uh, put it that way. Uh, John, I think that's that's critical. And you talk about the cost benefit analysis and we can't just look at benefits. Uh, my background, of course, is crisis management. And I, I can't tell you how disturbing it is to watch uh, leaders say, oh, I'm just going to abdicate all of my responsibility to a health officer, uh, a mid-ranking bureaucrat who, who might have been a doctor for a while. Um, and 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 they're going to have all of the control over the decision making process and i'm just going to defer everything to them that is an absolute abdication of your responsibility as a leader to take counsel from multiple sources and put it all together and take the decisions that have to be taken and own those decisions and stand by them but of course if they owned the decision and stood by it then they would have to accept responsibility for the outcome and that's something that they they just won't do at the moment. But look, I think it's fantastic that you're out there. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for giving me more of your time than you probably, I've taken more of my, your time than I, I, I said I would. I apologize for that, but it's great to have you on the show and I think I could talk to you all day long. Um, but but John, uh, uh, you know, good luck with the Liberal Democratic Party. I do think it's a political force that we need. Indeed, it's good to talk to you, Damien, and I'll, I'll keep you up to speed. Thanks a lot, John. Dr. John Humphreys, thank you. And that's all we have time for today, folks. Please like, subscribe, and share the show. Remember to send us an email at theothersideost at gmail.com. Uh, just ask to be added to our VIP WhatsApp group, uh, and I'll send you the link to, link to uh, opt in to that. Those of you who've already sent, I'm getting onto it, all right? I haven't had time <laughs> a bit flat out lately, so we will. Uh, I will get on to adding you to that WhatsApp list. But just send us an email, theothersideost at gmail.com if you haven't already. Say, pop me on the WhatsApp group uh, and we'll make sure that you, you get a link to the show. It's not a chat group. It's just a broadcast group one way. Uh, and we just send out the link to each episode so you don't miss anything and you won't be bombarded by lots and lots of messages. Um, also, subscribe to Discern a Bull with an A at discernable.io, that's our platform, to catch all the other great content, The People's Project, uh, Matt's terrific interviews, um, and you know, do get on and click and like and support us as much as you possibly can, folks, because that's the only way that we can continue to grow. Sharing with your friends is actually the best, the best way for us to grow and, and recommending that they do the same. Um, so thank you for your support so far. This show has gone from um, you know a few hundred uh, diehard listeners an episode now to several thousand listeners an episode. So we really are, um, you know, we're well above the the five thousand the show mark in terms of uh, audience that are staying with us for the whole thing, which is just terrific. So thank you, and let's keep going. Stay safe. More importantly, stay free. And we'll catch you again in a few days. Yeah.